to think of God's working with us as a superb and incredibly capable psychotherapist who is trying to awaken the unconscious. And the unconscious has several different aspects, but the one I'm concerned with here is the contemplative potential, which is an innate gift to every human being in virtue of being born. To gradually unfold over a lifetime into this fullness of life and understanding through relationship. God is only relationship, as far as we're concerned. Hence, relationship has no end. It's unlimited. Doesn't the relationship eventually become ultimate identification? When, when Meister Eckhart said, uh, the love with which I love God is the same love with which God loves himself, awareness of this deifies me. Yes, that's another way of saying it. But isn't the relationship ultimately with yourself then? N no, because there is no self. The self, who is the self? It's a very good question. Someone once wrote that you can never see God because God is not an object, God is a subject. <laughs> you can't see God because when you are God, there's nothing to see. How has your understanding of prayer and your experience of prayer changed throughout your own life? My experience has been fairly uh, classical as far as I know. I greatly studied the scripture and the uh, great experiences of the mystics. Uh, later I was able to include the experiences of other great sages and mystics in the other traditions. And so I see contemplation as the awakening of this contemplative dimension of life. In the Eastern traditions, they would call this meditation or deep meditation. Every movement of development in contemplation reveals more and more the mystery of silence and the uh, advantage of receptivity over effort in prayer. It, it gives one this whole new perspective on reality, uh, and it goes on expanding with each new level of relationship with God. Intellect is a marvelous tool, but, but it's, it's only a step on the way to much better uh, forms of relationship with God. And we never d dispose of it, but we use it with discretion, knowing now its limitations and that there's relationships that are much more intimate and profound than, than our human intellect can grasp. Now, of course, consciousness, like other aspects of life can get stuck on one level of development and, and you can remain a little childish all your life or an adolescent or, or a fairly uh, stuffy uh, young adult and then an, uh, an unchangeable old timer. All of these uh, stuck points hinder prayer. So prayer is a constant detachment from the God we know. With gratitude to the God we did know, but realize that we knew him only through our human limitations. And so prayer then reflects our attitude towards a God who is changing. I might even say a God who is dying and being born again in a more complete, fulfilling, and comprehensive manner. <laughs>
In other words, the child in prayer is becoming an adult, and an adult uh, is capable of more relationships, of more profound relationships, especially relationships of love. And so God begins to be approachable through various relationships of love uh, with great variety, and, and I'm, I'm sure that every human being has a unique relationship of growth and with God. God is totally committed to the transformation of each of us. We call this traditionally in Christian terms Lexio Divina. It's the prayerful, attentive, worshipful, even pondering is perhaps the best word that gives way almost automatically to certain feelings of encouragement or delight or affirmation, that uh, a sense of closeness to God at times. But because of the primitive character of our relationship, still on this more mature level, we, we get lost from time to time in the details of life, or as one poet calls them, the dusts of this world. And then you feel bad and you feel guilty and you have to deal with feelings of failure and distress or not knowing where you're going or you're confused. And it's especially confusing when you move from one step of knowing God uh, somewhat uh, limited way to a way of knowing him directly so that it's as if one feels embraced by God interiorly or, or kissed or, or held or as St. Thomas More described it when he was in the dungeon waiting to be martyred, God dandeleth me on his knee is the way he described it. In other words, God sort of played with him in the, in the enclosure of his cell. So you might say that God has two ways of presenting God's self. One is, is the created way, which appears through our senses and irrational apparatus and through religious forms of revelation and discussion and information. And also in the interior life, in, in deeper experiences of union, like if you read St. Teresa, you hear about her ecstatic experiences. and. Uh, the love of God sometimes pulls people's consciousness totally into itself so that they're totally forgetful of themselves. <laughs> it's a great thing to accept the God of, of the created reality, including those extraordinary experiences of St. John of the Cross and the great mystics, or even high stages of enlightenment in the Eastern religions. These are incomparable graces, but that's not the end of the journey. <laughs> and so if you want us to be satisfied with that, that's your choice. But beyond that is God as he is, as it is or she is, because God is beyond all gender. Who God is in his own interior life, 
beyond all reality, this perception is not communicable in words. It's just there. If you're not attached to the God of any of the lower levels of human consciousness, however advanced and marvelous these are. So the greatest experience of God is no experience. It's accepting reality just as it is. That's why we need people who are approaching this kind of, of infinite curiosity, not just to know material nature, but to know the very source of everything that is in its own mysterious identity. So a contemplative disposition eventually becomes total receptivity. And in that receptivity, one is aware of a, of a deepening silence that is growing or an attraction, an irresistible attraction to be still. So silence leads to stillness. And this doesn't happen every time you sit down to pray, but it's a stable space of interior silence that opens to spaciousness that is alive. So when we speak of emptiness, which you could speak of, it's another metaphor, you're not speaking of just emptiness, but an emptiness that is beginning to fill with a presence. So the best sentence I can come up with is that uh, contemplation is when silence, interior silence, morphs into presence. And as this forms as habit, you feel a deeper silence that might be called spaciousness. There's nothing in it except a certain vibrancy and aliveness. You're awake. But to wake to what? You don't know. But you're awake to something that is absolutely marvelous and totally generous and that manifests itself with incre increasing tenderness and sweetness and intimacy. There's a receptivity and an attraction to silence. How does that translate into walking around everyday living? What's it feel like to be acting out of that state? <laughs> well, you'd like to be acting out of it all the time. But the dust of this world have, have a great attraction too. So it, and it needs a great deal of experience and a great deal, I, mean, I dare say, of opposition from external circumstances to force that attitude ever deeper and deeper so that one can endure uh, persecution, uh, tragedy, pain, uh, disappointment, sense of failure, and guilt feelings of all kinds without it affecting this deep space of vibrant spaciousness and openness.
At the same time, the freedom of choice increases with contemplative prayer because you're no longer in a straitjacket or under the influence of, of cultural conditioning, preconceived ideas, and one's own programs for happiness concocted in childhood that can't possibly work. Like, to be perfectly safe, to be loved by everybody, and to have power over everybody else. How can it happen? This isn't too much competition. But it sounds like a lot of the planet is still in the playpen, as far as you can see, in terms of their consciousness. Uh, yes. I think that would be uh, fairly obvious to everybody. I mean, here are these people uh, capable of becoming God, and they're, what are they, shooting each other, and they're carving each other up, torturing each other, uh, beating each other up. This is the disease of, of original sin, or the fall, or simply lack of evolution. And this is the mercy of God that he identified to the point of becoming one of this bedraggled race. And he invites us to become one with him in that project. So in a sense, how can you be happy if even one person is not enjoying the fullness of happiness? I don't see how you can do that unless you have some pride left in you. And pride is the chief obstacle to this transformation. Most of my life, as far as I can see, has failed in all the things I really wanted to do or accomplish. And, uh, and so it's coming to terms with, with that very existential uh, experience of the human condition that, uh, that I regard as, as my greatest treasure. i put it in uh, one word powerlessness. For me, that's my greatest asset. I think, I'm inclined to think it's the most important thing to learn in the spiritual journey in any spiritual tradition. And this is what a lot of fairly naive followers of Jesus complain about that he treats them so badly or he doesn't answer their prayers or they, they have the same fate as other people who don't practice the religion. Well, this is absolutely childish. But we all have to pass through this because we are childish for a good part of our lives and some of us for the whole of them. So I identify strongly with St. Paul's experience that he, he says, that God sent him a thorn in the flesh to prevent him from getting too elated. What it actually was, we don't know. Maybe malaria or some physical or temperamental disability. But he really wanted to get rid of this, and so he prayed three times. That uh, three in the scripture is usually a symbol, at least in his mentality, of, of urgency or or completion. So he prayed mightily and he felt that this was a terrible obstacle to his mission. So God's response was, which he quotes, was, my grace is sufficient for you, for power is made perfect in weakness. So then Paul shifts and he says, Gladly will I boast of my weaknesses, that the power of God might be manifest in me. So 
So, that I understand to mean success is, is the most dangerous of all human experiences especially in religious circles because the transformative process is so wonderful that the temptation to attribute it to oneself even in those who are far advanced like Paul was is so dangerous that God in his great concern and love makes sure that you don't run the risk of attributing any of your so-called legacy to yourself. It's absolutely essential for people who are exercising any kind of teaching or leadership of a spiritual kind to pass through the utmost interior purification and angst, including what John of the Cross has called the dark nights, which are not just dark. Spanish word really means obscure, that you don't see where you're going, or you don't see the results of your labors. You don't see anything. So that this is the greatest security, because it's no security. It's recognizing that one isn't doing a thing that brings the greatest uh, peace and contentment. And so the biggest failures are perhaps the greatest graces. And to learn to be content with that brings the deepest peace that is available in this world. place in your life where there's maybe more life behind you than there is in front of you. What do you look for next after the, the body and the spirit? The body goes one way and the spirit goes another. What are you looking forward to and what do you think happens after death? Well, I, I'm a Christian, so I believe in the resurrection. So you get a new body that is spiritual and better. That's the teaching of Paul. So, so the process of dying is, is the only thing that's going to die is our thoughts. So death could be looked upon as the birth canal into eternal life. A little confining and scary maybe, but it's into a new and greater life. Eternal life means life without space or time limitations. So it's spaciousness itself. And, and you begin to taste this in deep contemplative prayer. You don't give it to yourself, it's already there. So there's already a process of dying and rising happening in At marriage. every moment, in fact, dying to the false self and rising to the new self with, these, with the eye of faith that perceives God in everything that's happened, absolutely everything that happens. And even in our negative feelings, even in our sins, the divine presence is, is unavoidable. It fills everything down to the smallest degree, as Taryarcha puts it, Christ is present in every subatomic particle. So we're walking around here as a, just a bunch of particles that have been put together with a certain energies that are invisible to us.
but it'll always be unknowable what the ultimate is. And I wonder if we'll ever know who we are fully. It doesn't matter when you experience yourself as, as, as God, that is to say, not as God in the sense of those childish ways of thinking of him, but God in the sense of total self-surrender, total gift of self, total non-possessive attitude, letting go, just being, being the manifestation of God in our particular uniqueness. So letting go really is the essential practice because you already have everything you need. It's suggested in St. John of the Cross's description of contemplation in which he says contemplation is total receptivity. And so it's the opening of the spiritual will, the mouth of the soul, to receive the gift of the divine nature itself through grace. So to be hungry for that experience is to, is to listen at the deepest levels.